So we've been getting a lot of questions about different musical instruments and how they can lead to upper extremity problems. So here to explain some of the problems that you can get into playing the piano is our esteemed medical expert, Dr. Robert Markison. He's a San Francisco hand surgeon and someone I've been calling on for over 29 years for advice about repetitive strain injuries. So welcome back to the show, Dr. Markison. So nice to have you. Thank you, appreciate being here. One of my musician friends was saying, well, is it good? Is it bad to play the piano? And so where shall we begin? Well, first of all, let's say it's good to begin with because you appreciate time and space on a piano. And if you're on your way up as a child, you wanna cultivate, or even as an adult, cultivate ambidexterity so that you've got 20 muscles in each hand working well, the intrinsic, you're properly using neck, thorax, larger muscles in the limbs, and you have a balanced brain because you're playing the piano. So that's good for brain, hand, instrument, sound, maybe audience linkage. Uh, the dark side is obviously how do you use yourself in the course of either a learning curve, maintenance, or expansion of your skills. And so to start with, and th these are the do's before we go to the don'ts. Do make sure that you're sitting upright. Uh, look at your music if you need to, but memorize everything you can quickly so that you're not locked onto a surface. And I was taught as a fledgling musician to understand the mechanics of music, the way the instrument works, but memorize absolutely everything. So you never look at a piece of sheet music unnecessarily beyond the memorized moment. I was also taught that you play for a few minutes, recording it in real time, and then listen back. Cycles of action and repose. And you archive the material every three to six months for 10 or 15 minutes. And my archive stretches back 50 years, not through narcissism and vanity, to the contrary, to understand what it sounded like to do something then and to do something now. Comparison, marking, charting your course. The other thing is uh, sitting up straight, memorizing everything you can, being totally relaxed, adjusting your piano stool so the height is right, making sure the action on the piano is not so hard. Many people practice hard action pianos or hard action weighted electronic keyboards. It, you should be able to hit a note almost like a leaf on a pond in autumn, maybe a little more, but you always practice at a lower sound dynamic level, pianissimo, occasional mezzo forte, never forte, never fortissimo, so that all structures are in a very whisper, whisper-like voice. You never, you never want to scream on any instrument, it's unnecessary. And so, yeah. go ahead. I, I was once consulting with a musician and she, her maestro, and this is where we get into musicians getting into the same trouble as their teacher did, because she would aim from a very high point, go straight through her finger and really ballistically crash the keys. And she, this was what she was taught. This is what she was told to do. But even to the ear, it didn't sound right. And when I was at the Miller Institute, I found that when the musicians were playing in a, a softer, more modulated way, as you recommended, they sounded better. There was more nuance and what was going on. So how do you break it to somebody you really shouldn't be pounding the keys? Well, I, I recommend that all teachers whisper to their students and students whisper back. As soon as you're hitting the top, there's no more top. When you're starting at the bottom at a very low, almost inaudible volume level, there's plenty of top. You can explore that anytime, but you're not doing a Sousa march that brings people into battle. You're really doing something that should be nuanced level. Eric Satie comes to mind, Fur Elise, Beethoven come to mind, Moonlight Sonata come to mind. Uh, very, very soft. It doesn't mean you don't have the, the juice to get, get punching on the keys, but there's no reason, even though a piano is a percussion instrument, to be terribly percussive. It's just like the drummers that I take care of. I always say, how are you on the brushes? In other words, the whisper on the skin as opposed to sticks. Uh, which they don't need as much. In any case, we're back to how you hold yourself, 
you get on YouTube, you watch great George Shearing, the blind, gifted, blessed British pianist, jazz player. Kinesthetically, he knew where he was all the time. So he didn't have to look at keys. In fact, he couldn't, he was blind. And so once you, once you get to learning and memorizing a piece, you close your eyes. You're not looking down at the keyboard because when you put your head forward, you're gonna load, extra load the spine and surrounding muscles and so on. And when you're, when you're comfortably seated, then you're not mashing on keys. That's very important. And then you, you warm up a little bit and then warm up doesn't mean ultimate span stretches. You could do a very, very light stretch and you can play your octave scales. First of all, the, the problem I see in some pianists is that they fail to improvise. In other words, they don't realize that it's important to know the repertoire of the piano, but it's equally important to be able to improvise around it. And so the sooner, earlier in life without uh, forsaking classical rigors, they learn how to improvise, the better off they are in the long term. And so understand theory, harmony, meat and potatoes of music so that you not only own a piece as written, but you can tell a story once and never again, which is jazz. So that's important to be the equal schooled student of what is through composed and be the real time composer sharing a waking dream as the instrument vanishes because you've mastered enough to avoid looking. And so, you know, not everybody has to be a blind pianist, but let me tell you, I've learned mountains uh, from treating them, watching them, studying them. It's a good idea not to look at the keys, not to look at music. Have that relaxed posture, not suddenly going here, suddenly going there, not being stiff wristed, not saying it must all go to here, not fingers as hammers, but just very easy. The Taubman School is, is one of the schools that's ergonomically sensible in some ways, not in others. There are a lot of acolytes, accolades for that school, but you have to be a little bit careful, but the idea is rolling around as opposed to flat handed and all of this kind of stuff. So. And also, obviously, I play games to try and make things easy. And I'll do the left hand work with the right hand, the right hand notation with the left hand, and feel free about switching the responsibilities of right and left, again, in the interest of short and long term ambidexterity cultivation and maintenance. Now, and to play one hand, play one handed pieces is great. Play the use the left hand to play the right hand side and so on, switching around so that you're comfortably both halves of the brain. Should musicians be considering the shape and size of their hands before they choose a, mus a musical instrument? Because someone with small hands is going to be at a natural disadvantage playing a piano. The keys are fixed. You can't adjust it ergonomically to fit you. Um, and then that's one question. The other one is about technique. I mean, you briefly talked about ulnar deviation and dorsiflexion, but I think probably it's helpful to talk to know about technique. Right, and again, I'm, I'm, I play piano every morning just to start the day and feel, because the piano is a mother, father, brother, sister, grandma, grandpa of music, and you need to know it no matter what you play. But if you have small hands, you might just get a, a smaller keyboard, even if it's electronic, it's okay, as long as you're not straining yourself. That's important. Again, I mentioned the action, the mechanism of the piano, which should be a medium action. Some people play a hard action to get ready for any piano in a concert hall, but that's a little too much. Uh, the idea, since the nature of piano is decaying notes, obviously, and so you don't have a graveyard of dead and dying notes, but you know that you can't increase the volume. You can't do a vibrato on a piano. You have to kind of emulate it somehow with clusters of notes or chords that are gonna bring up volume. But again, starting at the bottom, playing very softly. But uh, as far as actual technique, it should be totally loose. I mean, you should let your hands drop and appreciate the tenodesis effect, which is Greek for the pull of tendons. When I drop my hand, my fingers extend because the tendons are pulling over the top extensor surface. When I bend my wrist back, the fingers are curling in because it's the pull of the flexors bringing them in. So the wrist is the key joint of the hand. 
So you use your wrist. You don't, don't play stiff wristed with fingers as hammers because that makes you uptight. And if the audience is looking close up, makes them uptight as well. Uh, again, the warm ups matter, but it doesn't have to be strict little hand and exercises at all. It should be totally, totally relaxed. It's, I agree with you, the size of piano matters. Start small as the, the violinist starts on A quarter, half, three quarter, full size, four slash four violin, and so on. You don't quite have that in pianos, but starting small is a good idea to make sure you have the ears. And I'm often playing tiny things anyway, the smaller the better for me to play very miniaturized instruments. And I, I have small little keyboards, small guitars, small, small little instruments, small little instruments that I play. Because the last thing I want to do is waste my brain, hands, heart and ideas on full size things unnecessarily. You know, we're, we're talking on about something that's, you know, sort of falls into the category of hobby, but according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics in 2006, and I couldn't find anything more recent, but apparently this isn't a bad number anyway, musicians um, employed in the United States, the rate of musculoskeletal injuries reported was 50 to 76% among professional musicians. And I know some people who used to play for the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra and, and that sort of thing. And it got very complicated um, because they can't take breaks when they need to necessarily. So very often they're paying, playing fatigued or in pain. And you know, it just leads to this cascade of uh, problems for them. And some of them were saying that they needed to change their repertory. They could play certain classical composers, but not others and certain pieces within certain genres, but not others. And I, I just felt for them because it's an occupational problem. Right, when I first published for the international audience in 1989 about musical hands problems, instrument modification and so on. Uh, 30 to 60% was the number for uh, International Conference of Symphony and Opera musicians in terms of the prevalence of upper limb or neck, thorax, musculoskeletal strain. And by categories, they do indeed get strained. I, I do encourage everyone to improvise. And again, never forsaking the classical pedagogy and rig rigors. But if you're a, an artist, you know how to compose a painting. And, and that's incredibly important and essential as an, a true artist in two or three dimensional rendering. And if you're a musician, you should equally be a composer. And it doesn't hurt to read Schoenberg's Lives of the Great Composers and understand what they went through to become who they are. And to become a real time instant composer as a jazz musician does not degrade your classical repertoire. The ones who get stuck are the ones who fail to improvise and they've overplayed and overpracticed at high dynamic levels with poor posture, straining their upper limbs, uh, mirroring uh, injurious postures that their teachers taught them. And so you don't wanna have a negative self-fulfilling prophecy and overdo it and overuse yourself. Obviously there are the constraints of being in a concert setting, being cramped in a Broadway show, although much of that is now synthesized music that doesn't have a lot of people on a small stage, exposure to weather conditions, failure to pre-hydrate and post-hydrate when you play, uh, inadequate nutrition, too much, or even any alcohol, and these these kinds of or stimulants, too much, too much of this, coffee, that sort of thing, and so uh, how you maintain yourself matters, and hopefully, more and more orchestras as the COVID epidemic loosens up and there are more public concerts, uh, more of the management will understand the ergonomics of playing and the ne necessity of good general health for the performers. Do you find that it, anxiety or performance anxiety can be an issue among these musicians? Absolutely. I mean, they're uniformly, when they get to professional levels, they're extremely bright, awfully self-critical, sometimes brittle in that regard. 
if they have cold hands, then they set up set the stage for inadequate blood flow to moving members. And so they're operating at a low oxygen tension and inadequate nutrient flow to the hands and inadequate outflow waste washout. So that these are kind of stagnant in terms of circulation and they're very tense and they're tight. And so you, you have to, at the point of professional arrival without arrogance, realize that you've done a lot and it's time to be kind to yourself without losing uh, the expression or breadth of knowledge that you can share. And so it's just like surgeons, having trained surgeons for 40 plus years on two faculties. I know who's gonna make the long distance gracefully, uh, not hurt anyone and probably become thought leaders and at least teach, teach others. They're, they're relaxed, capable, economy of motion, economy of thought, not overdoing it at any step in or out of the operating room. And so having a solid confidence without uh, all this tension really, really helps you and shares with the audience. Vladimir Horowitz was fabulous, but very tense. Then I'd look at Arthur Rubinstein, a man of the world, walked fluently on the world stage, played on all his keys, very relaxed and very interpersonally accessible. So you don't sacrifice your, your skill set by being a relaxed, fluent human, because ultimately, whether you're in music or any other domain, it's fluency. And fluency should be calm and give confidence to the listener or viewer. I find that that really applies also to the world of movement. And, you know, I'm a teacher of movement and yoga. And very often when you're talking about improvising, I will improvise movements. And I give my students permission um, because sometimes you see people really locked into a pose and I, I don't think that's healthy. So why not experiment? Find the degrees within the degrees, much like one would improvise in playing jazz or something like that. Um, but Dr. Markison, one of the things that concerns me, I haven't read every study on musicians. I mean, they, they will talk about the kinds of injuries that musicians will get from various instruments. But one thing that they rarely address and I have never seen addressed is the non-musical use of the hands. And I'm really questioning, are these musicians letting off steam or trying to distract themselves by playing video games? What is their computer technique like? Everybody uses computers nowadays. You can't use your other pair of hands to play the piano, to play the guitar. So I, I really question, I think we need to broaden our view and look at this more holistically than perhaps people are. Well, I, I certainly agree with that. The total scope of upper limb use in and out of work or play matters greatly. It doesn't mean you're going to blow your warranties by playing a single video game once in a while, but obsessive use of the hands, depending on somewhat on genealogy, ancestry, proneness towards arthritis, usually matrilineal transmission, uh, other, other factors, whether you're vitamin D deficient and so on, hypothyroid supplemented adequately, whether you have diabetes, prediabetes, it's adequately controlled. These things are all chemical, physiologic elements, but in terms of the total scope of upper limb use, just, just be a little careful, be, be aware. If you're in the kitchen cooking, do you have to crank that jar open? Uh, could you get a jar opener? These are simple props that are not, not just for the aging hand, but for the hand that wants to make it gracefully uh, through whatever task you have. And in terms of the sorts of injuries that musicians might encounter. I mean, they talk about nerve entrapment, thoracic outlet, osteoarthritis, focal dystonia. Um, I mean, it sounds like the usual suspects um, that you might find associated with computer use or any upper extremity issue. Um, do you find any particular, like a higher rate of carpal tunnel syndrome or you know, epicondylitis from ulnar deviation of the piano? 
Well, again, the head forward, limb forward postures are gonna to contribute to cervical spine degenerative changes, myofascial strain in the thoracic regions, cervical, thoracic regions, thoracic outlet syndrome is the far end of the spectrum, but irritability of the brachial plexus, the nerve roots and trunks and cords and divisions and all of this stuff that is go are going to lead to the peripheral nerves they can be tightened up at any point. And if you're forward reaching too much, you engage pectoral muscle and that can tighten the plexus, stretch it and so on. So points of potential irritability, neck, thorax regions, and then out here. And once you go palm down, you start to stretch the forearm muscles and you can potentially strain the weaker origin, which is the lateral epicondyle, common extensor tendon, and regions on the, the end of the humerus here, extensor carpi radialis, and so on. So all of these things can be kind of strained if you're doing too much. The ulnar deviation, you can almost see it visibly on my forearm, flexor carpi ulnaris, extensor carpi ulnaris. These things are being strained and pulled and these are being stretched. So I'm out of whack. I'm really out of balance, whether it's broad, broad structures on a piano or perimeter keys on a keyboard or mousing in some kind of odd posture without using foot pedals, which are a good thing, without using voice recognition software, which is a good thing. Never waste uh, time on a slab of plastic, even if it's adjustable as a keyboard when you can use your voice, again, anything for fluency in words and numbers. Writing code's a different story we can talk about separately. But between foot switches, and fluent use of voice recognition software. You won't abuse yourself on a computer keyboard. The uh, back to the piano, as we go out, there are two pathways of inquiry that I as a physician must look at. The first of which is neurological, nerve irritability or entrapment, defined entrapments, carpal tunnel syndrome, ulnar tunnel syndrome, cubital tunnel syndrome, radial tunnel syndrome, pronator syndrome, superficial arch, superficialis arch syndrome. These are, all, these are all things, even distal radial sensory entrapment neuropathy. These are all things that any well, preferably board certified hand surgeon is going to be looking for as he or she puts that final filter on what's going on. That's one pathway, the nerves. Two is inflammatory conditions that may be clearly anatomically discreet, like the queer veins, where the first of six tunnels on the top, not carpal tunnel, gets tight. And so that's a lot of cross under can do that. Too much span can do that. And so overuse, abuse of the thumb can cause tenosynovitis, inflammation of tendon sheaths surrounding tendons going through a fiber and bone tunnel. First extensor compartment, eponymously named dequer veins. And so there are other forms. There's flexor carpi radialis tunnel. There's extensor carpi ulnaris tunnel. So there are various little channels through which the tendons have to go and glide to activate the fingers in a marionette type style. But there are anatomical variations that may be and make you prone to inflammation. Many of the great violinist pianists have natural congenital ligamentous laxity so they're at risk for straining things, going too far, too fast, too often, stretching the tendons over very lax joint capsules. And so that's something to avoid. Don't, you don't have to exploit it just because you have it, meaning ligamentous laxity. Very common to great musicians and Niccolo Paganini, who wrote the great horrifying 24 caprices, had Marfan syndrome, which means arachnodactyly spidery fingers. So he could go anywhere and everywhere with his terribly long fingers and good enough to frighten just about everybody who followed studying the caprices. You have to be careful in terms of who and what you're trying to emulate when you do it. As we go out and look for anatomically discrete inflammatory conditions, we consider stuff that's not obvious but needs to be checked. Individually testing tendons, muscle tendon units for tendonitis thumb flexor, checking independently, constraining these digits as you check and I do isolated resistance of these tendons to see if you might be able to, for example, 
in the middle finger find out that you have superficial flexor tenosynovitis, tendonitis at rest level. And then, of course, you're looking at the fact that not no two hands are created equal even in the same person. So 37 plus percent of hands don't have an independent little finger flexor system. I'm in that group. My ring and little work together. So the last thing I want to do is exploit the interdependent little. We look at my opposite hand. Hooray, I've got a completely independent superficial flexor on my left hand, which makes violin comfortable for me, which makes a lot of things comfortable for me. Since I use three fingers on a trumpet, that's comfortable for me. The key cluster on a clarinet, uncomfortable, which is why I had to modify my clarinet. But having said that, anatomy will be destiny to some extent, and you don't want to abuse it because you can provoke inflammatory conditions that may be subtle, may be difficult for the even the astute examiner to figure out. But they can be figured out. Uh, so the two pathways of inquiry, one, neurological brain, really, but certainly neck to fingertips, both sides. Two, anatomically discrete inflammatory conditions. And there's a whole array and each one is worthy of a separate video and we've done a lot together already. But suffice to say that if the examiner and the person him herself is looking carefully at what's going on, and I encourage people, even if it's disinformation or wrong information on the internet, to go on there, not to scare themselves, but to have a framework for discussion in a Zoom or in-person interaction with their uh, medical professionals. Well, this is all fascinating information, Dr. Markison, and I, I can't thank you enough. And we will be doing more segments on not only different aspects of this issue, but also different. I mean, you're so well-versed in so many musical instruments. I, could, I think we should do them all um, and help those musicians out there. And uh, one thing <laughs> that I'd like to leave people with is um, if God didn't want musicians to take breaks, he wouldn't have invented the intermission. So I think, you know, it's a really good idea, not only to improvise, but also to just stop and do something else and rest. I agree. And as a boy, I was taught that music is 90% listening, 10% playing. I still do that. Good for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Marcus, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.